Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today we have an extraordinary experience for somebody who uh, almost was one of my professors way back in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s at University of Toronto, but wasn't. Could have changed my life. So it's Dr. Stephen Conan from Sherbrooke University. In my view, there will be prequel podcasts on Dr. Conan's work, so I'm not going to go into that here, but he is one of the most influential people, in my view, on not so much the ketogenic diet, but the use of ketones relative to the brain and other body. So I want to go back before I even open it up to Dr. Conane that he wrote a sensational book that I often refer to in a positive sense is Desmond Morris on steroids. And Desmond Morris in the late 60s wrote a book called The Naked Ape. And the life was simpler then. And it seems like a lot of people were really interested in that. And Dr. Conane had the audacity to criticize that and send him a personal note, but never got a response to that. I was impressed with that. But anyways, Dr. Conane's book is called The Survival of the Fattest, and that will tell you his predisposition. And it's, he is a combination of an evolutionist, a biochemist, and I think a molecular biology. And it's not for the light of reading. It's fascinating. So if you're a health practitioner or somebody who's somewhat comfortable with understanding biochemistry, you will totally love this, and even from a lesser distance. But I'm just opening up to a page. The problem with my book is it's now dog-eared on every page with questions and comments, but this will give you an example, and then I promise we're going to go to Dr. Kunin's more current work. But here we go, page 178, under genes, brain function, and human brain evolution. We go, most of the body's plan of humans and chimpanzees are very similar, with the difference being largely restricted to skeletal structure, body hair development, skin pigmentation, neonatal fitness, and brain size. 1% between the genomes of humans and chimpanzees still represents about 300 genes. Some of those gene differences may be silent, while others may be more affected by environmental differences in humans and in chimpanzees, or vice versa. Genes controlling brain complexity and body fatness in neonates are likely to be functionally linked because humans lacking neonatal fat, premature infants, have higher than normal risk that full development of brain complexity will not be achieved. In fact, the very existence of risk that brain complexity will fail is an important clue to examining genetic and environmental controls on that risk of failure. This is a clue that will need to be followed up in order to understand the close relationship between vulnerability and complexity in the evolution of the human brain. The issue of how biologically a biological complexity resides in a relatively small increase in the number of genes is a thorny one focusing science to scientists to examine more closely how genes interact and are controlled. The last uh, the second to last part, I promise. The amino acid sequence genes for brain proteins differ from twice as much between humans and other primates as genes for liver, white blood cell proteins, etc. The apparent larger differences, difference in gene expression for brain compared to other organs suggests that sometimes in the recent past allowed the human brain to begin to evolve faster than the chimpanzee brain. It goes, and that's just two pages. I mean, it, it begs the question of, and when you look at, when you think about Dr. Kinane, so this was written about uh, 2004, I think it came out. 
but his your Stephen, your predisposition of looking at the brain and its development and how we got here. And part of that book was, you know, part of it doesn't make sense until we allowed, you know, fat to come in so we could have fat babies and how important that was in storing it. So that's a whole topic. And I set that up because you've now gone much deeper into the study of ketones and ketone uptake in brains. And oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff to, to cover. And what got you into the ketones from that? I mean, I, I look at that and say, that's a great, you know, uh, evolutionary like, academic that really went deep. And now you're the ketone guy. I mean, you're specifically are the ketone brain guy. Well, thanks, uh, Carl. Uh, my interest in ketones was really stimulated by uh, two, two things that uh, occurred essentially simultaneously. One was that we stumbled over the fact that the way the brain uses polyunsaturated fatty acids actually involves a lot of degradation of those fatty acids, some of them, alpha-linolenic acid, and it produces ketones. So if you put make tracer forms of these fatty acids, you can show that a lot of alpha-linolenic acid ends up in brain cholesterol, which had been shown 25 years before I studied it. But nobody paid any attention to it, and nobody knew why or how that happened. Mm -hmm. And I explored that and realized it was happening through ketones, and I thought, that's, that's something I'd never heard of. That's really interesting, exciting. I'm curious about that. Let's explore it. So that was, that was one side of it, a little bit of biology of ketones and, and brain development. The other was that this was the time when, I guess, uh, the ketogenic diet for epilepsy got its first big wave through the, the film First Do No Harm, the Jim Abrams story, the Charlie Foundation, and this ketogenic diet. And at the time, I was in a, in a nutrition department in Toronto, and I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. I was convinced that it was some kind of, you know, artifact or, or but, but I was also nagged by the fact that we were seeing ketones were important in the brain. So I started to put these two together and had probably had a more open view of the ketogenic diet than I would have if I hadn't realized that ketones were contributing to brain lipid synthesis. So that, that's the start of it. And I worked on brain development and ketones and, you know, well, where do they come from? What's the stimulus? You can't be on a, the infant's not on a ketogenic diet. So what's the origin? Well, I have medium chain triglycerides in milk and guess what? We've got fat babies. Mm -hmm. This looks like a clue to part of the story on nutrition and evolution that had been completely ignored because evolutionists study what the adult brain can do and the social interactions and the, the skills in making stone tools and all this hunting ability and so on. But all of that's irrelevant if the infant's brain is, is not developing normally. So it really has to start there. What supported this huge infant brain, which is even bigger than it is in adults? And in fact, ketones are an essential fuel for the uh, developing brain there. It's not just an alternative fuel for, um, for when you're fasting or energy restriction or on a ketogenic diet. It's, it's essential day in, day out, 24-7. Mm -hmm. So I, I started to see these two things as, and oh, so maybe that's why the ketogenic diet is beneficial in epilepsy, although we still don't really know why that, why it works, actually. That's amazing. That was amazing. So was there a point from you coming in as a skeptic, but saying, you know, something's beneficial here to you saying, wow, you're now, it's in, it's in you know, breast milk, it's part of the baby's, you know, predisposition is necessary to go this is actually a really big deal that we should follow this because you came in, they say peripherally saying, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, and, and almost like, it sounds like you're willing to, I'll, I'll be the one to disprove this and show that it's really just, you know. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, uh, this is the second time in my career that this has happened. I was sure I could disprove another particular point er earlier. And wow, I, I would, the study I designed to disprove the point, in fact, proved it. And so I had changed my view on that one. And the same thing with the ketones. Absolutely. So the physiology of ketones, and then I, as I explored it, this was a field that was broken open by the likes of Hans Krebs, uh, responsible for the Krebs cycle and the tri or tricarboxylic acid, citric acid cycle, if you like. Uh, so the heyday of the ketone story is really in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, most people uh, since then have completely ignored them, partly because of this general paranoia around ketones and, and diabetes and, and, and medical uh, health. 
That's right. So, That's right. Which is a legitimate problem for, for the insulin-dependent diabetic, absolutely. But it, it kind of dismisses all the important physiology associated with ketones. Right. No, absolutely. So Hans Krebs is an interesting character for sure. But he also worked in Otto Warburg's lab. And I think he wrote a brief sort of semi-biography in Otto Warburg. Am I correct there with that? I, I don't know. I hadn't followed uh, Krebs's career except to know obviously a little bit about the, the cycle. Yeah. They're, they're all fa amazing. I find there's these epic thinkers coming together in a blossoming of all these ideas. And one was, I say, like just after World War One, you know, you had... Uh, well, the ketogenic diet coming, you had insulin being isolated, you know, and it flourished for a while and then got forgotten and then back to the 50s, 60s, 70s era. I am going to go to some of your summary points because I want to start at the end and then come back to uh, brain uptake. So I'm going to read to you about you in essence. So some of your conclusions, I think this might have been it from the Ohio State talk you gave one of your, play, one of your many talks. In cognitive decline, glucose metabolism doesn't function well at all. So it seems the brain isn't getting adequately fueled. When you add ketones to someone with cognitive decline, their brain can and does metabolize them very well, in fact. Third point, more ketones you add, the more brain seems to use them. So different levels of blood ketones can make a difference. When you exercise, ketones are more efficiently or more readily metabolized into the brain. And then uh, you mentioned increase your ketones and exercise to reduce cognitive decline. Those are some pretty big points. I mean, nobody, that would have been dismissed a couple of decades ago. <laughs> it's, it's still, it still is today by the, the majority of, may, of what we call mainstream researchers. I think it's true in every field, actually. Uh, you know, there are people who are seeing things differently in every field and their work is dismissed and, unless they get a, a breakthrough. They're either ignored or, or it's dismissed, and, and the same thing is, is happening in Alzheimer's. But it, as you said, it's, it's a growing field now, uh, ketones and, and energy, uh, energy rescue of the, of the brain. Specifically, you talk about the energy rescue. Would you say that when you have, because you have some amazing technology that sort of opened the door, the, the keto PET scan. Yeah. And was that sort of the beginning of now you can actually see and it was giving you eyes where you can only guess where things were, you know, now you can compare it. You know. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> when I moved to, to Sherbrooke uh, 15 years ago, it was to take a position to work on aging and to uh, utilize the university's excellent imaging facilities and their openness to develop new tracers. Um, and so the funding I was given to start my research position was plowed straight into that ketone pet story on on the speculation that we could identify whether the pattern of the problems with glucose also existed with ketones because i didn't know at the time that earlier studies based on what they call arterial venous difference across the brain had shown that ketone uptake was normal in alzheimer's disease so the pet well, allowed us to confirm that and it allowed us to show where the regional differences were and, and to look at not just a global situation of a difference, but a pattern. And it established fairly quickly that in fact, the pattern was very different than it was for glucose and was normal for ketones. So it was uh, definitely with the purpose of studying that, that I went to Sherbrooke. And then the idea was, well, if it's normal, how far can we push it upwards in order to, to sort of fill the energy gap created by, by poor glucose metabolism. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking at some of your slides now, and they're all incredibly interesting. One is you're comparing, so this normal cognitive band from young to older people to mild cognitive impairment, and their glucose uptake, which is high and young, and also ketones. And as they get older, it's the, the ketone looks like it's lower that's probably about diet but how when you add a group that you added 30 grams a day which is what just about two tablespoons of mct oil that ketones themselves sort of brought them into the normal functioning range right so there's there's two points i think one is that yes not only uh, is the ketone uptake um, normal when you don't have a ketogenic diet or a ketogenic supplement it's normal in alzheimer's it's normal in older people but that you can 
uh, increase the capacity of the brain to use those ketones by simply supplying more, which is not the case with glucose. Glucose uptake by the brain is, is controlled by the brain's activity. So you can uh, take all the glucose you want and you're going to get a huge surge in the blood, but in the end, you're going to cause insulin resistance and you're not actually going to get any more glucose into the brain anyway. There's two parts to the, the brain ketone uptakes um, to calculating it. One is the, what they call a res uh, the constant, which is the, the capacity of the brain to actually take up the ketones. And that's not the same as the actual level in the blood, which is the other part. So when you put the two together, you can then calculate the total amount consumed by the brain per hour or per day or per brain region or whatever. Now, as you get older, the plasma levels of the ketones start to drift downwards. It's never been significantly different than the young in any of our work, but the, the tendency is always there. So when you look at that graph you mentioned, the ketone uptake is not artificially lower. It is somewhat lower because the plasma levels of ketones are a bit lower. But the capacity of the brain, that, re that constant, that that uptake rate constant is still exactly the same in young people as it is in older people, as it is in MCI, insulin resistance, Alzheimer's disease. So the blood level then determines how much is going to get in, but the ability of the brain to use the ketones is, seems to be absolutely constant. So in, in, in verbally saying at this graph, would you conjecture that the lower levels of the ketones before we added them, that the decline from, from younger as we got into older, do you think that's dietarily induced? I mean, since uh, ketones are kind of a concentration gradient, you know, it's the higher concentration, the more we have for the brain. And if we were to kind of go back, looking through your book idea and saying back, 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 do you think if we're calling that paleolithic or just how we evolved in early man over 200,000 years, do, would we think that the ketone levels would have been higher across all age brackets because their diet was different. So I, starting with the first part, I think that the main factor is insulin and the ability, the, the uh, insulin is the, what, what you could call a policeman in the intersection directing traffic. And when glucose is around, then he puts his hand up a stop sign to the ketones and the fatty acid released from adipose tissue and, and lets glucose go through. Uh, but that if the effectiveness of that policeman in the intersection declines with age. So our ability to metabolize glucose goes down slowly. Some people it gets worse uh, sooner, but in, in general, even in the healthiest older people that we've been able to identify, there's still a slower glucose metabolism and it's largely attributable to a less effective insulin, which is also like the policeman in the intersection, blocking fatty acid release from adipose tissue, which is the source of the ketones in the blood when you fast. So that's the reason that it seemed to drift downwards. And so coming back to the paleolithic situation, we have a lot more refined carbohydrate and cereals in our diet today. The percentage of carbohydrate is probably higher than, than it was 100,000 years ago, even a million years ago. So I, I'm sure we were in a ketogenic state more in paleolithic times, apart from the fact that food supply was probably not as reliable as it is today for most of us. So the pressure on insulin was was lower, right. um, and probably we didn't probably age as long as, as the longevity was probably uh, not as as long either. Uh, but that's another thing. So diet does have an, uh, an effect, and I think it's primarily mediated by insulin. Got it. Got it. Absolutely. I wanted to go to the end of your, the very end of your uh, Ohio State uh, presentation, because. Um, it says an interesting thing. So your, your parting comment was brain energy rescue by ketones is definitely feasible in mild cognitive impairment, feasible in Alzheimer's disease, trying to let the brain to have the luxury of thriving in a fuel environment that it was born into. Cognitive benefits still need to be better defined in terms of mechanism of action. Don't know if it's just a fuel effect, if it's a signaling effect or an anti-inflammatory effect. What are your, given those three categories, what are your thoughts? You think, well, I don't know. It could be any one of those. Do you, you have a, you know, an unresearched sort of saying, you know, my, because you're at the edge. You think it could be all three or do we predispose? I, 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 if, I would bet on all three um, for sure. 
because all three are, are well demonstrated, at least in, in uh, experimental models. Um, uh, we don't have very good tools to look at neuroinflammation in humans. We have some tracer tools. We have indirect measures in cerebrospinal fluid and plasma cytokines and so on. But to my knowledge, almost nobody has, if I think nobody, in fact, has really looked at the relationship between plasma ketone levels and inflammatory cytokines, for instance, which is still only an indirect measure of what's going on in the brain. Right. Um, but I would predict that there is a, an inflammatory benefit um, and in fact, uh, an anti-inflammatory effect of, of ketones. Um, ketone signaling and acetylation and epigenetic effects, I, I don't really know anything about them. It's not an area that I've, I've explored, but I, could, uh, I think there's convincing evidence that some effects can occur that way for sure. Mm-hmm. And the fuel replacement aspect, uh, maybe that's the foundation on which the other two are built. I, I'm not sure. It, it seems fairly obvious that if you can get more fuel and you let the brain do clean up its mess a little more effectively than it can do if it's if it's starving all the time. So I, I, I'm sure resistance to infection and resistance to inflammation are part of the benefits uh, of ketones that you um, that help the brain manage its affairs better. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So 15 years ago when you went to Sherbrooke University and for their imaging studies because now I, I'm looking at you know glucose, so regular PET scan versus a keto PET scan, and it's like looking at two different people, uh, and obviously control versus Alzheimer's. Can you take us back to that time? Because that must have been like wow, you know, because because what you revealed and are revealing still is it is not just Alzheimer's or or various stages of dementia. It's actually all of us at some point start to show. MCI, mild cognitive impairment at a far earlier age. And, and, and that was something that was never talked about. I mean, who, who thought of that? It was just looking after our family members that couldn't look after themselves because of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And so that opened up a whole door. Exactly. Uh, we all are at risk of MCI. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you talked about me arriving in Sherbrooke and, and the eye opener. The eye opener was that the ketone uptake was was normal um, mm-hmm. in in the MCIs and the Alzheimer patients. Yeah, so um, yeah, it was normal. And and I think any any good scientist who stumbles across some infra, some uh, basically confirms a hypothesis with the initial results uh, of, a, of a series of experiments. And it takes time. It takes time to build up the PET methodology. It takes time to do the animal studies before you have permission to do the human studies. So everybody's anxious and very keen to see the results. The first thing you got to do is say, is there any technical reason why this could be an artifact? Is this really biologically valid? So every, we really went back to check everything and make sure, does this make sense? Uh, are we just sort of, have we got confirmation bias here? Or are we uh, really got our eyes open? Because if this is true, um, yeah, it does open up a whole field of brain energy rescue and therapeutics that is important. At the same time, I don't remember exactly when, I, I stumbled across these earlier papers, one from 96 from Tokyo and one from 1981 from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, both of which showed by that arterial venous difference method that brain glucose uptake was lower in Alzheimer's, but brain ketone uptake was not. So I thought, wow, phew. Um, we're not the first, but in some respects, it's good to have someone that was there before you and used a different method. When two different methods confirm the same result, it gives you a lot more confidence that there, there's unlikely to be an artifact or some technical reason why it's not true. Absolutely. So we were encouraged by that uh, for sure. And it was a wow moment. And it's it's still a wow moment because ultimately the person with MCI or, or, or Alzheimer's doesn't really care whether their ketone uptake is going up in the brain or going sideways. It's a, who's going to help me with my memory problems. And that's, right. that's what it's all about. When I first heard you speak, um, I think it was a couple of metabolic therapy conferences ago, at first I came to just hear, I think I came with the thought that I was going to be learning about uh, Alzheimer's and essential fatty acids or, you know, MCIs, MCTs. And what I left with was actually kind of a personal, this is something that I should look at for me because you mentioned that they, you've, you've noticed or they have noticed or collective research has shown that 
you know, as I said, we all have some degree of mild cognitive impairment. I had not heard that before, and therefore it was a big deal. So I took it, I, I took it as a personal look at this for yourself, Carl, and look what it's done, you know, Dr. Mary Newport's talks and so on and so forth. Those are very moving. And so there was two different areas. Would you say now from what you know that, you know, part of the audience is for call them younger people and saying, uh, sorry, folks, we all have MCI to an extent. And this is one way you can improve yourselves. I mean, it, that was a lesson. That's what I took away. Would you say that that's a, a, an important point to, to broadcast? Oh, absolutely. You, you've, you've got to start thinking about your brain before you get to retirement age. Uh, that's for sure, especially as far as the insulin is concerned. If I left you with the impression that we quote, I think you're saying oh, we all have MCI to a greater or less extent. Um, I, I don't I wouldn't have intended to make that point uh, if that's what you uh, understood. Uh, in the sense that there are aging-related changes in, in uh, cognitive function in, in all the main domains, but some of them actually get better. We're actually better at doing some things as we get older. Um, and so it's normal to have changes with aging uh, in cognitive function, memory, executive function, processing speed. But it's not a sign necessarily that there's a, a defect just because there's a change. So a change isn't a defect. And MCI, aging is not necessarily equivalent to MCI. Some people are, are still renewing their driver's license at 90 years old. Uh, and they have the competence to do those skills, which are obviously involve a lot of uh, cognitive uh, performance to, just for driving as an example. So uh, I, I think some people uh, inversely uh, in their 40s and 50s have essentially mild cognitive impairment. We very scarily, very scarily uh, came across um, insulin resistance. Well, we didn't. Uh, lots of people have, have shown that polycystic ovary syndrome in young women uh, is associated with insulin resistance. Other hormonal changes, important hormonal changes, infertility and so on. But insulin resistance seems to be one of the underlying features, which, by the way, responds very effectively to a ketogenic diet, as I've learned since then. Those women were 24 years old. They didn't have obesity, which is quite common in, in polycystic ovary syndrome, but it's not always present. And they had lower cognitive performance at 24 years old with a pattern of brain glucose uptake that looked like someone who was 75. So it's not just a, a function of aging. It's a function of the brain's ability to use fuels um, and that changes with age because insulin changes with age, but it also changes long before you get old if you have uh, insulin resistance. I think that's the main thing. There would be some genetic uh, factors that influence the rate at which the brain metabolism changes, like mutations that affect Alzheimer's, Down syndrome, for instance. But these are more, uh, the, uh, mutations are not something that you can change. Lifestyle is something we can all change. Um, and and that's, that's the really, I think, the bottom line in our story is that um, most of us are not affected by those mutations. And most of us hope we're going to get old. And most of us, if we want to age uh, healthily, have got to take care of, of our insulin sensitivity. And that involves partly what we eat but mostly the amount of exercise we do, because you know we, you, you can eat a lot of fat, um, you can eat a ketogenic diet, which by definition is, is rich in fat, and your insulin resistance is, is gonna get better. So it's not just about fat intake, if you're concerned about nutrition, it's about the relationship, the total energy you're consuming, the refined carbohydrate you're consuming, and if you're eating a lot of refined carbohydrate and fat, i.e. junk food, then for sure you're going to have a problem. But it's not the fat per se that's the villain. As the ketogenic diet has shown in, in children, in adolescents, um, in polycystic ovary syndrome, in, in women in their 30s, and in people who are 75 years old who have Alzheimer's disease, have been on the ketogenic diet. Russell Swerdlow at Kansas City Medical Center has been working on this and published it last year. They don't drop dead of, cardi of cardiovascular disease. Uh, they don't gain weight. Uh, their cardiovascular risk markers are not increased. Their LDL is not going up significantly. So a ketogenic diet is, 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 is a good way to accomplish this goal, but it's a major change in, the, in dietary habits. Right. Given the fact that it is a major change, and now we're speaking about the Alzheimer's population, it's kind of hard 
to get them to have that ketogenic diet change when they're already starting to lose some function and, and it gets more difficult for them to take care of themselves. So it's really about care implementation. Uh, it's, yeah, and it, you know, if, if you're caring for a relative that does have Alzheimer's disease and you'd like to try to start the ketogenic diet, I think you need to, first of all, you need to be informed uh, a lot. If you're the personal caregiver and live with that person, then both of you really should attempt to, to do this together. So they're not two sets of meals being prepared. And I would advocate, I haven't done this on a long-term basis, but I would advocate for starting it gradually. What can we reduce this week? that won't well, make a difference maybe the first day, but afterwards you won't really notice it. Is it orange juice at breakfast, for instance? Mm -hmm. Can we get rid of orange juice? Can we try? Um, how many desserts are you used to eating per day? In old age homes, for instance, it's commonly it's two. Uh, can we get rid of one of those? Can we start with this on al alternate days and start to wean people off the refined carb rate one step at a time? If, if you drop all the carbohydrate and, and increase the fat to 90% from one day to the next, for sure there's going to be resistance and, and gastrointestinal problems, and uh, it's not going to go anywhere. So uh, it's got to be gradual, and it's got to be sustained, and it might not work. And, and that's something one would have to, uh, in the sense that it might be too hard to implement. And, and so that's, But you don't have to be on a ketogenic diet, in my view, to age well. It may be beneficial in some cases, but um, it's not essential as my, in my view. The, the question is getting in, make, taking care of insulin, keeping insulin happy. And that's, that's the bottom line in my view. Yeah, no, I hear you loud and clear. So, which brings us back to the carbs, the kind of carbs or carbs in general. You know, and that, that whole issue has been, you know, from people out there doing what is referred to as carnivore, or maybe you can sort of say zero carb, you know, they're, on the proteins, hopefully fish as well, but usually it's just meat in that reference. But where do you fall on the whole carb thing saying, you know, oh, carbs, they've caused a lot of problems. And yeah, maybe we ate plants in our past, but you know, if we could just like knock it off for a while, we'd get back to a, a healthy population and reduce our medical costs and so on. Or are you saying, well, that's a bit extreme. Let's just let's just start with the orange juice and work backwards on a population basis as well. I'm not speaking about Alzheimer's only. Yeah. Um, do, do you have a carb attitude, so to say, at this point, or case by case? I'm terribly boring when it comes to this because I think the human body can function on a wide range of of macronutrient intakes. Um, and I, I hate the yo-yo um, concept of swinging from too much carb to no carb. Yeah. Uh, it's boring because somewhere in the middle, most of us are going to be able to age well yeah. uh, with some carbohydrate intake. Um, some some whole, whole grains uh, are not going to kill you. Uh, the refined sugar is not a good idea. But if you are uh, an advocate of, of um, or if you practice um, a moderate amount of exercise on a daily basis, um, having uh, the equivalent of a, a chocolate bar every other day is, is not going to kill you. I, I don't believe it. And I don't think anyone can demonstrate that. So you get these fads and, and the worst thing as, as you get older is this thing about fads. And if it's not this, what's it going to be next time? If you try the ketogenic diet and don't succeed, where, where are you going to go next? Yeah. So you can go to whole to, to the carnivore diet, which I don't know in detail, but most of these diets are, are people define them differently according to, the practitioner they're following but too much meat intake is as far as i know is not good for the kidneys mm -hmm. and eventually you're going to pay for it at that level so um, do what your grandmother said and be moderate about your uh, about your dietary habits and and i think you you know it's gonna it's gonna work it's it's not just about food it's about exercise it's about social interaction it's about cognitive stimulation. And um, the, the, all four of them are pillars of, of healthy brain aging. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. In your research, your life really, has there been something that by you knowing about it academically that you realized, you know, I'm going to be changing this part of my life as I get older because of what you knew and what you do know? I, I, I guess so to some extent. I've, I've swung a little bit from one extreme to the other. When I was a graduate student, I had a series of blood samples taken for a, a particular experiment and someone analyzed the cholesterol on them, in them and said, this was taken weekly uh, over, over more than a year. And they said, you know, your cholesterol is over 300 uh, in the winter, uh, total cholesterol. I said, 
So what does that mean? I hadn't a clue. You know, I'm a graduate student, right? The British parents, bacon and eggs, let's go. I was also moderately fit, uh, but I, I had no idea. So then I went anti-fat for, I don't know, probably 10 years. And then I, you know, I wondered uh, really what was the importance of that. So, you know, everybody's susceptible to, 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 everybody should be looking at their risk markers for one thing and, and you're susceptible to making decisions. But it, when you look at the quality of the data out there on many of these topics, it's very, very sketchy. The cholesterol story has been, and the statin story has been built on a house of cards. Um, the, the whole dietary fat thing, I realized I was very anti-fat until I heard about the ketogenic diet and thought that was crazy. But why did it work in epilepsy? Um, hey, there's a connection with ketones. Why, what is this anyway? And I swung aw away from that. So, and I realized that there, it's, it's very easy to be dogmatic about this sort of thing. It becomes very religious, in fact, uh, our, 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 and it's a belief system. And there's so much science out there that's based on animal studies that doesn't necessarily translate to human studies that you can find the literature that you want to back your way of living. Sure. And you can argue about this night and day. It's a bit like politics. My guy's better, you know, my, my party's better than your party. But uh, in the end, um, it's, it's, it's your belief system that's going to control what you eat. And if you believe that you're impervious to salt, then <laughs> eat all the salt you want, you know, and, and so on. So, or the same thing for meat or fat or carbohydrate. And, and I think somewhere in the middle, uh, there's, there's a lot of latitude. We've evolved over yeah. millions of years, hundreds, uh, well, millions of years. Um, and we have a, a flexibility. The brain is an opportunistic user of fuels. It doesn't just depend on glucose, which was, was believed for many, many years. Um, ketones are beneficial, but there's a flip side. You, I think you can overdose the brain on ketones. It's pretty hard to, but I think you can. Mm -hmm. And and so there's no, it's not black and white. There's no magic bullets in this business. And I think that a moderation um, in a general sense and durability, sustainability of your whatever your approach is working for you is is critical. Well said. Well said. You know, they're like a diet politician. <laughs> I appreciate that. Very deep. And, and it's it's uh, just I don't want to get boxed, paint myself yeah. in a corner, and say yeah. you got to do this and you got to do that because uh, I think most of the time the people that are doing that uh, have their own belief system, uh, and God bless them. But. Uh, in the end, there's probably arguments against many. Obviously, you need a certain number of minerals, a certain number of vitamins, uh, and th those are, uh, you can't get around that. But uh, those are, are not often in play in our, in our diet today. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time, and that is our product of C8 Keto MCT Oil. How is it different and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7% caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind our C8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, and that is all three ketones, your beta-hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there, they come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid. We put a little bit in our coffee. We make our mayonnaise out of it. We make uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, 
but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast. It's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis, as along with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best, and I thought you should know. Thank you.